in this conversation, I just want to pick up on a couple of things uh, that you've talked about and, and we'll broaden it out a little bit uh, as well. And then there'll be time for questions at the end uh, from the audience uh, as well. You talked about, you know, we're failing if we're not able to bring people to account. Um, your office has reported on atrocities that are taking place in Syria. Um, most recently, what looks to be the gassing of civilians there. Um, and on things that are going on, on the border of Myanmar, where more than half a million Rohingya uh, people were driven from their homes. What hope do you have, or how likely is it, do you think, that the people responsible for those can be held accountable? I think it's, um, I think it's very likely, sorry, I think it is likely that at least some will be held to account. There is, isn't a Syrian family that I've met or uh, kin of those who have been abducted and subjected to the most appalling of conditions who wouldn't demand it of a new Syria. To imagine that we could go back to the conditions of January 2011, where the torture of chil children is a condition that seemed to be normal to the state authorities, is uh, unimaginable given the volume and the extremity of the experiences that they have uh, been put through. But it will take prob probably time. And it's not going to be possible to, of course, prosecute all those who've committed the uh, violations. And I was just talking to a colleague who's from the US uh, Holocaust Museum. Uh, for years, I've had the honor and privilege of knowing Ben Ferenc, uh, the prosecutor of the Einsatzgruppen uh, in one of, it was one of the 12 subsequent trials following the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg. And you know, the Einsatzgruppen were the death squads following the Wehrmacht as they crossed into Eastern Europe, Central Eastern Europe and into the Soviet Union, murdering men, women and children uh, in large numbers uh, of uh, Jewish origin. 3,000 of the killers escaped justice. Many were rehabilitated in, 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 in employment terms, rejoining the West German Federal Police Ministry of Interior. But 22 of the leaders of the various groups were convicted and a number were then sentenced to hang, including some highly educated people as well. And that's another point that uh, always struck me, that uh, there's no direct correlation between high levels of education and humane thinking. Uh, in fact, one of the leaders, uh, Otto Ollendorf, had two advanced degrees, like the first uh, commandant of Treblinka had two advanced degrees. And there is some horrifying thought as well that in a room like this, you know, 70% of us are capable of the most terrible of crimes. If we cannot somehow create a limit and put, impose a limit on the extreme forms of behavior, then it creates an anxiety because what do we do with the lesser forms of discrimination that can still be debilitating for a human being and the fear that comes with it, for example. And that's why to preserve our sense of who we are as a species, it's necessary that we do this. And for all of those who uh, basically uh, feel that it's unimportant, well, what is the alternative? What do they suggest that we do? You know, and it's not uh, easy to find alternatives when people have suffered so grievously. And so there's no doubting that it's a struggle and we have to struggle. And it doesn't come easy. You know, I, I have a discussion with uh, a number of colleagues about where artificial intelligence is going. It depends on large data sets that reveal basically the prefer preferences of human beings. And where human beings, you know, have inclinations. But when you look at human progress, it doesn't come from a majority position. It always comes from a small number of people 
who believe that slavery is wrong, against a predominant feeling within a society that it's right. <coughs> and algorithms don't really do that. It's human beings who do that, at great risk to themselves and great sacrifice to themselves when doing or when putting forward a different position. And so the struggle will continue. And this, I think that's a really interesting point to raise in the building where we're sitting, especially given the Supreme Court across the street, as well as the rights, of the, the, the role of uh, uh, protecting minorities. Um, uh, the, the way you talked about the, the time taken to prosecute some of those, uh, the Ansatz group, and also the fact that Ratko Mladic's conviction in the International <coughs> Criminal Court happened some 20 years after the end of the, uh, the conflict in Yugoslavia, also I think talks about and speaks to the enduring nature of the principles of human rights and of human rights law as well that have been enshrined in the declaration. And you know, this, is the seven, this, is, this year is the 17th anniversary of, of that declaration. Um, you've called this year's celebrations of it a campaign of defiance. Yeah. And so I wonder if you could just explain a little bit about that, why that. Well, it's, it's precisely the, these attacks on the Universal Declaration that uh, spurs us to think in that way. Uh, because if we are to completely cede to it, again, it's not that uh, we're moving into a space un unknown to human experience. We've, we've passed through these, these fields before. And you can begin to understand. I mean, you just, you, all you need to do is to travel around the various continents to see what happens, where you have pervasive discrimination, pervasive deprivation, and you have fear. You have fear. People fear their governments. They fear their police forces. They fear their neighbors. You know, if we decide that it's okay to basically get rid of civil society, give all the power to the governments, not hold them accountable, concentrate power in the individual of one person or in the one person's uh, office. It's a path well, well worn and it's a very sad path and it doesn't produce in the long term the sort of benefits that you need to see and p humanity needs to grasp. I, I'll be visiting an African country in a few days. The last time I visited them, the youth were telling me that economists will always say that uh, the government has to create X number of jobs to sort of placate the youth if you have a youth bubble. And they said it's not about jobs. It's about the right sort of jobs. It's about the jobs they want and they need. It's finding, it's, there's a sort of condescension by saying you just give them jobs and they'll stay quiet. Yeah? And that's what we need to do. But I've also been thinking, and uh, we had this discussion this morning, so this is fresh off the press, so to speak. There's something horribly elitist about the way that many of us who see ourselves as expert lawyers, expert economists, expert sociologists, when we're in the field and you're sitting in an IDP camp where you're talking to people who suffer so greatly, and we use language and we use and I think it's more out of vanity, a sense of self-importance. We don't break it down in, in a way that's accessible to everyone. And I think that, that partly explains this sort of dislocation and this lack of connection, I think. And uh, there has to be, a, it reminds me of a meeting I had with the victims of sexual slavery in Seoul, in so-called uh, comfort women. We don't like using that term, but um, some of them, some of whom are still alive. And uh, after I met, I went to their home and I sat with these remarkable women who suffered, I mean, uh, cruelties one can barely conceive of. I mean, some of them were abducted as young as 13. And if you worked out the rate at which they were raped on a daily basis, 7,000 times a year, practically. No internal organs practically left. Many died of cancer subsequently. Very few received any attention. And they, they were saying that they didn't really want reparations. They don't want formal declarations of remorse um, 
scripted by lawyers. They just wanted the Japanese prime minister to go visit them, sit with them, you know, hold their hands. And they said, we have no problem with Japan. Japan is an ally. Japan is a country that we are friends with, trading partners. But why is it so hard for the man to come and sit with us and talk to us? Why does it have to be a declaration and an agreement between states? And that's partly what's missing in our, in our world today. A sort of deeper human empathy, I think. And that's what we need to somehow recover, I think. Yeah. How do we in this room do that? The, the other day I was um, leafing through various books that I, I, had, I hadn't looked at in a long time. And there's this uh, wonderful book um, by a Sufi poet in the 12th century, uh, Farid al-Din al-Attar, entitled uh, The Conference of the Birds, and some of you may know it. It's uh, an epic poem in rhyming couplet. I think it's the longest poem in rhyming couplet. And it's still published, I think, by Penguin. And it's about a group of birds, and they're lost, and they need a leader, and they need definition, and they need direction. And so this small bird, a hoopo, says to them, I know where there is a leader, uh, but you'll have to cross seven oceans, you'll have to fly to incredible heights, and it's an allegorical tale, of course, and you'll have to go through a significant number of different experiences. And one by one, the birds start to drop out of this. The duck says they can't, the parrot cannot, the nightingale is too worried about it. But the rest embark on this. And most of the, the poem is about the discussion and the experiences. The rest embark upon this uh, incredible journey and they're going to find the Simor, the, the sort of mythical Persian bird. And they arrive at the appointed destination. And they're led in. And there they are. Each bird standing before, standing before a mirror. And in my experience, and I go back, I don't want to go from the sublime to the ridiculous and talk about rugby again, but, but when conditions upon, <coughs> impose themselves upon us so that each of us has to be a leader, it is entirely possible to do that. The way you protect yourself ultimately as a human being is if you protect other people. If you're only worried about your own protection, and everyone else is worried about the same thing, just their own protection. The agendas eventually collide and we are all lost. And how many times do we have to go through that? The only lesson that's worth remembering is you protect others and then others will protect you. It's so simple. But that's the only conclusion we can derive from any deeper understanding of history, not a cursory, not a appropriated history to serve a political end, but a deeper understanding. And I think that's what defines us as humans. When I was in Guatemala and I met civil society there, it's a remarkable civil society. I mean, it was the most raucous, noisy, I mean, they were sort of, they were denouncing everyone, including me, and I was the guest. <laughs> and, but what I found so amazing is that they were not speaking about each group speaking about its own interests. Each group spoke about and defended the interests of others. So the persons who would, you would expect would be representing the rights of indigenous people were actually speaking on behalf of persons with disabilities. And so on and so forth. And it was amazing. And that's the sort of world that I want to live in. I don't want to live in a tribal, partisan, hate-baiting, you know, cruel world, which is where we're trending if we don't move in the other direction. So, given that point that you think we're trending that way, and you talked about traveling the world and seeing all the kind of um, atrocities and the things that are still happening, the denials of rights, um, 
how do you feel, do you feel, to what extent has the last 70 years of having the Universal Declaration of Human Rights been worth it? What, what, when you reflect back, what, what's been the progress that's been achieved? Well, I mean, you know, look at, look at Switzerland where, <laughs> where I'm living in. You know, in Switzerland, women only achieved the right to vote in 1972. You know, well within my lifetime. I mean, you, when you look at the rights of children, the rights of women, the prohibitions on the use of torture, uh, enforced disappearances, arbitrary detention, I mean, the gains have been immense. The problem is that we have so much now to lose. When I last had the honor of coming to the Hill, I, I spoke of this rather amazing book, and I don't know if any of you picked it up. Uh, I'd, I'd be interested to know if anyone actually listens to my recommend, picks up my <laughs> recommendations. But it's this book entitled 1913 by uh, Florian Illies, a German journalist. And as uh, the historians among you know, 1913 distinguishes itself because it's this most remarkable year where human contributions to knowledge were almost unprecedented in every field, whether it be technology, science, art, culture, everything. And the book goes through this month by month. And in the book, dotted here and there, you have these various expressions. It began by this English-British uh, publicist, uh, Norman Angel, in 1910, and then picked up by others, that a general European war is impossible. Impossible. Not in a year like 1913. <laughs> and the danger is that we're so fixated on our achievements and you don't realize how close to the cliff's edge you are. I mean, I, I did ask my, my office, I said to them, we are told that the internet will never fail. You can't break it. There's enough resilience, it's dispersed enough. I don't believe it because I believe anything that we humans can create, we can destroy. We're capable of destroying it. So what would be the human rights cost of a completely collapsed internet worldwide? And that's, that's the sort of import of think of what, you know, the, the juxtaposition of human progress and, and human tragedy in the most extreme form. How important has the US leadership been in the development of uh, human rights agenda and human rights uh, uh, over the last 70 years, and what role should the US going forward play when it comes to human rights in developing countries or across the world? I, I was going to make a sort of rather pathetic comment that I've only been alive for 50 odd years, so I, you know, you're making me sound older than I am. No, <laughs> but I have nothing against people who are but over 70. Your scholarship has encompassed more <laughs> than that. No, I, the contribution I, was profound the contribution was profound, but there is this misapprehension that somehow it was an agenda driven by the North. The contributions to the Universal Declaration and the subsequent uh, treaties that anchor human rights law were the sum of enormous, enormous effort from a variety of different sources. You know, countries like Jamaica, uh, Ghana, India, uh, made huge contributions to it. The Indian delegate made huge contributions to the rights of women. And what we see happening around the world now is a sort of reverse engineering on some of these issues that these are not, these are Western values and they're not. Look, I, I'm sorry, you know, again, when you sit with someone who has been battered by violence, it doesn't matter whether you're talking to them in the northern part of Sweden or somewhere in, in Myanmar. They know, they know that they, their rights have been violated. And so the, 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 the argument is clear. And if we were to disperse all of it, certain people have greater rights than others, all right. You know, Viktor Orban the other day, on his website, and we took it off his website in English, 
made a statement to a group of council and said, we don't want people of our color to mix with people of another color. Prime Minister of a country of 10 million people, the heart of Central Europe, whose country has experienced torment and torture, not least the actions of 1944, should have been enough, should have weighed on his mind enough for him to be ashamed of what he said. And he said it. And how many people protested, do you think, around the world? That it's okay? That this is the world we want to live in? I don't think it's the world we want to live in. I, it's clearly not the world my children want to live in. And I don't think the millennials will, you know, I mean, if we are so bankrupt of ideas that we have to go back and, and dig up this, this, this toxicity just to win another election, I mean, shame on us. Shame on us. It's just a form of thuggery, and I can be quoted on that if you'd like. I think we have quite a lot of millennials in the room, many of them who are working for members of Congress here in the U.S. What do you want them to take back to their offices, to take back to their, their principles? What do you want them to tell them about how, you know, what should, uh, what should be the role going forward now of the U.S.? I mean, the U.S. has been known as a defender of freedom and a defender of rights. What should be the role of the U.S. going forward in developing and increasing and furthering, protecting, promoting human rights in developing countries or across the world? You know, I, um, I sometimes sit around with colleagues from the U.N. Not sometimes, often. And they say to me, the High Commissioner, you, you, you and your office, you're outspoken. You know, we all want to speak out, but we can't. You know, we have other interests, we have other pressures, and, and so forth. And I say to them, look, I, quite frankly, I don't believe you. Because speaking out is difficult. It's difficult because the victims expect you to deliver, and when you can't, you feel deeply insufficient in trying to help them. And so the burden on you is enormous. But at the same time, no one remember you. Your, your, your family, those who will outlive you, will never remember you if you spent your whole life silent when you see so much injustice. I mean, you have to be able to speak. I never thought that I had any, I, when I look at my, the colleagues in the field and what, and what others are doing, I mean, there's this lady who came to see me a couple of weeks ago. And every year she comes to see me, and every year I'm amazed that she's still alive. Because in her country, which is rather violent, she criticizes everybody, everybody, the government, the police, the security, uh, the, the rebel groups. And how they haven't killed her, I don't know. And I'm amazed she keeps speaking out, and she's very conscious of the dangers. I mean, I, just amazing. I'm not like that. I'm more of the type that worries about these things. What, what did sort of affect me, though, is reading the two volumes of the of, uh, biography on Theodore Roosevelt. And early on in his life, he never felt that he had any courage or he could speak out or he could do things that he wanted to do. And so he said, uh, you know, just begin acting brave. And then eventually you become one, or you try to become one. So everyone has within themselves to, to say what they need to say. But again, I, I urge you know, everyone in the room to think about not their own narrow, th thin interests, but the interests of everyone. So one more specific, specific question for me, and I'm going to open it up to uh, members of the audience. Um, the US, as you know, has withheld $65 million in payments to UNRWA the organization that provides schools and health care to Palestinian refugees. What do you think is going to be the impact of that? I, it's, I, it's, I, ha I have to admit, um, uh, of course, the uh, colleague who leads uh, UNRWA is uh, someone I know very well. And is a deeply thoughtful, decent human being with a past in, in the International Committee of the Red Cross. And I believe it, it would be a terrible thing to whatever country denies those who, who suffer. Um, when you look at the capital markets today, 
the size of the global economy. The fact that we have so many refugees, so many internally displaced, so many people that still experience extreme poverty, again, it's, it's, it's shameful. We have to give people some chance, some hope. I, I couldn't help but uh, sort of smile when I was in Davos with uh, a large number of members uh, from uh, Congress and others. And there were some politicians there as well who were taking a sort of a narrow view of migration, narrow view of uh, a third party relocation when it comes to uh, uh, dealing with uh, refugees and asylum seekers. And one of the most prominent uh, CEOs of one of the largest research AI firms and probably one of the most important people in the next 20 to 30 years, who was at Davos, was the son of a Syrian taxi driver. And his family wouldn't find entry in many countries today. And yet he now will command the stage for a good 10, 20, 10 20 years. Whatever the, the the cause of the spite or the cause of the anger or the anguish or the cause of the irritation. You know, again, that poor people, dispossessed people, children um, have to suffer for it. so much of it, I think, is the, the, the stain that we have to live with. And so I hope the less we can, or the more we can reduce it, the better it is.